The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone, and thanks for joining us today. I know that we have a large, large registration and Hello, everyone, and thanks so much for attending this Financial Social Work Monthly free webinar. We're excited to have such a high registration. We're not surprised because our speaker is well known and really knowledgeable about everything having to do with credit scores. Uh, so I'm not going to spend any more time Welcome you, welcoming you. I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, you can see that Rod Griffin is the Director of Public Education for Experian and is recognized uh, very much so as an expert on credit reporting and credit scoring. Well, that didn't sound good. Okay, I, I'd like to invite all of you to stay tuned until the end because we do have a special announcement and giveaway at the end. So we're going to start right off today with a poll. Um, let's see how all of you uh, learned about this webinar today because we do have a great registration. So how did you learn about the webinar? I'm launching that poll. And if it was some other way, you can go ahead down and also put that in the question box. You'll see the question box at the bottom of your rectangle. So it looks like most of you are part of our financial social work uh, community since you received our newsletter and the invitation. Okay, so most of you have voted. I'll go ahead and count it down and share those results with you. Well, I'm glad I did this poll today. Okay, so let's close that poll and I'll share it with you. So I guess those who I had it forwarded to them. Uh, their friends and colleagues know their interests. Um, and we're on all sorts of social media. And those of you who don't remember, we're just glad you're here. So let me hide that poll and we'll get going. So since we have such a large registration, we know that every month we have new people to financial social work. So we like to explain a little bit about, about what financial social work is and why we do what we do. So financial health, we talk a lot about financial health and financial wellness. And we know that after 20 years of working in this field, we know that it's about much more than dollars and cents. Now, certainly dollars and cents matter, but we look at it from a few different uh, perspectives because we know that a client's relationship with money and with him or herself is what drives client financial behavior. It drives all of our behavior and behavior is how we earn, spend, save, share, and borrow. So it's our financial behavior that determines our financial circumstances. It is as simple as that and as very complicated as that. But that's what we know about financial health and the fact that it's about so much more than money. So when we talk about self, we're referring to self-awareness, self-confidence, self-acceptance, self-respect. If we don't feel good about ourselves, then we're not likely to put in the time or make the effort to improve our financial circumstances. And here we review just one more time what we're talking about when we say that we work with clients to create sustainable long-term financial behavioral change in how we earn, spend, save, share, and borrow. 
So this we call the Wolfson Whole Person Financial Health Model. Again, because it's so much more than the dollars and cents. Sure, there's that money component, that self component, and the behavior component. We've already talked about those, but the other people in our lives who influence our financial decisions and society at large, where we are in the life cycle is going to impact and affect how we earn, spend, save, share, and borrow. And the fact that our health is a major contributor, contributor um, to our financial picture, but also our financial picture is a major contributor to our health because financial wellness affects um, us physically, mentally, emotionally, psychologically, and socially. And so when we just talk briefly about the life cycle model, um, we look at um, from early childhood onto um, older adulthood, what that means and how we can help our clients through adolescence and adulthood. So financial social work is ongoing, highly experiential, and is that behavioral model that I talked about. It incorporates ongoing financial education, motivation, validation, and support. It is interactive, introspective, and strengths-based, and it works individually and or with groups, and certainly many of our graduates use it to practice financial therapy. Uh, we incorporate a psychodynamic model that includes transformational learning and the trans-theoretical model of behavioral change. We just launched a brand new financial social work ebook this week. It is Financial Literacy Month, and um, we have a number of different things going on to celebrate Financial Literacy Month. So if you'd like to learn more about our model, about Mesereau's transformative learning model and uh, the, the trans-theoretical model of behavioral change, you'll be able to download that free from our web website. So here's what we believe. Dollars and cents don't make financial choices. That's why we say that it's about so much more than dollars and cents. Really, we make those choices. We each have this inner money self. And if we had more time, I would ask you to introduce yourself to your inner money self, because that's where your financial circumstances originate. And your money self includes your thoughts, feelings, and actions with your money and with yourself. So getting ready almost to hand this off to Rod. Um, we believe that financial healing precedes financial well-being, and it requires addressing the emotional, physical, mental, and psychological damage and challenges that financial problems present for all of us. And that financial well-being, our definition means embracing the financial component of your life so money is not a constant concern and stressor. It's about being and feeling more in control of your money and your life. This is a new graphic. Those of you who join us on a regular basis, I've used a different um, graphic for representing someone at peace with money. And I recently found this one and I'm very excited to have a new one to share with you. So financial well-being requires a healthier money self. That's someone with a healthier money self engages more readily, is more hopeful, is more eager to change, and is more prepared to succeed. And to work with you, if you're a counselor or therapist, whatever position you're working with clients, and to take some of this important knowledge that Rod is about to share with us. But we have one last poll, and let me bring that up, then I'm going to hand it over to Rod. So here we go.
Okay, hold on. This is interesting. I'm so glad we included it. Give everybody else a few more seconds to vote. All right, so 75% of you have voted. I'll count it down and share it with you. Okay, we got to 80%, that's a good number. So let me go ahead and close it and share it with you. And I think, Rod, this will be just a great jumping off place so that you can explain what people can do and why people need to know that they should. Okay. I would agree that um, most people are afraid, but we'll let, I'll hide that, and I'm going to give this over to Rod, and he can take it from there. And remember, we will be doing Q&A at the end of the session, Rod will give it back to me and then we'll do Q&A. And if you have questions during the presentation, you can be putting them in the question box. Okay, Rod, take it away. Rita, thank you so much. And I always appreciate it when you set the bar so low. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, oh boy, I have to live up to the bar you set. I'll do my very best. If you set it lower, it's easier. Um, but. Thank you all for being here, first and foremost, and, and, and for uh, wanting to hear from me. I, that's, it's an honor and it's a privilege for me to be here. I'm glad to be here for Financial Literacy Month, a huge month for all of us in, in the field, <coughs> excuse me, in the field, and i um, excited to share information. We will have uh, time for questions at the, at the end, so I want to try to cover the key points in about 30 minutes and then from there open it up to all of you because I think that's probably where uh, there will be more value in me being able to help you uh, answer your questions and, and not just talk at you. So start there. I want to kind of give a peek behind the curtain a little bit. Uh, some of it you will probably or a lot of it you may already know uh, I, and I can tell you that I agree with the results of the poll. Most people tell me that they don't get their credit reports and don't get their scores because they're afraid of what they'll see. And that's the wrong thing to feel. I mean, you can't do anything about it until you have it. And usually it's not as bad as you think. So really want to help people um, begin to improve their credit history, understand how it works and, and what's there and how scores work and how they play a critical role in your financial life. To start that discussion, you have to understand who the players are in that process. And credit reporting companies, of course, are what are best known for. I kind of jokingly tell people I put it at the top because we're the most important, but really it's because that's who I work for and I had to start somewhere. So credit reporting companies, we collect and store that information. Lenders use the information to help them manage and, and make risk decisions. Risk score modelers are the organizations that people either don't know about or don't think about and don't understand how they work. They are the people who create the scores, the formulas that are used to calculate scores, that use the information from a credit report to derive the numbers. So they include people like FICO or Vantage Score, uh, organizations like Experian Decision Analytics, which is a scoring company that com competes with and works with the others separate from the credit bureau, so not part of our credit bureau. The government, of course, is crucial in the process. We're regulated at the federal level through the FCRA as well as through states. So all 50 states have laws that govern credit reporting all the way down to if we provide a printed credit report, things like the font that has to be used and the size of that font. So very heavily regulated in terms of who can access a report under what circumstances and what they, they have to look like if you get one. Uh, so uh, very heavily regulated. And you, of course, as a consumer and the people you work with are at the center of that circle. You decide how you're going to use credit, how you're going to apply for credit. Are you going to, once you have accounts that are open, if it's a credit card, for example, are you going to charge to the max each month or just charge a minimum amount? Are you going to pay the balance in full? Or are you going to pay just the minimum due? Or are you going to pay something in between? You determine what goes into that credit report and how you use credit. And it can have control over that process. Uh, and play an important part in it, ensuring that the information is complete, that it's accurate, that it's working for you. 
and not something that seems mysterious. And Rita and I were talking before we started, and that's what she said. It seems so mysterious, and it really shouldn't. Now, credit reporting, credit scoring shouldn't be a mysterious thing that happens when the banker goes into the back room, like the first time I applied for credit, and said, I have to check your credit, I'll be back. And 20 minutes later, he came back, and I had no idea what he did. Uh, you shouldn't have that experience anymore. You should be able to get your report, know what's in it, know what your scores are, know exactly what the lender is going to see when they see your application or receive your application and not have any surprises. It's your credit report, your credit scores should be tools that you can use to your advantage. Uh, should be valuable financial tools, not a mysterious thing that you feel like works against you. And so I want to share some information today that I hope helps with that. We'll start with sort of the high level things. There are three national credit reporting companies. You probably already know this, Experian, Equifax, and TransUnion. Uh, one of the ones that starts with an E has been in the news a lot since last fall. Uh, it was not Experian, and I can't speak a lot to that, but there was a, a major breach, uh, and you know we'll acknowledge that, that, they, that there were some serious issues there and uh, has affected our industry, and, and we are working on that experience, especially ensuring that information is secure, that it's safe, that it's uh, that we act as stewards for that information uh, and help protect it from unauthorized or, or uh, inappropriate access uh, and are very diligent in that. Uh, the bureaus, the credit bureaus have been around for more than a hundred years and started out with at Experian anyway, uh, we say Jim Chilton in Dallas started the credit reporting industry with a little book that he went around to the local merchants in the city and took notes on, about their customers. That evolved eventually to companies like TRW and Cy Ramos who invented and, and created the first automated credit reporting system using computer technology in the late 1960s uh, and then we saw the advent of the Fair Credit Reporting Act in the early 1970s and eventually the evolution of credit scores to evaluate that information in the 1980s, uh, mid, uh, late 80s, early 90s really began to take off. So that's where we are today. But because of our credit reporting system, instant credit's available wherever you might go. Uh, it didn't used to be. You used to have to submit an application. There was a manual review could take days or weeks in, in order to get approved. Now you can apply for credit, get a discount at the counter if you want to take advantage of that, particularly around the holidays, for example. So instant credit's available. It makes credit lower cost in the U.S. than just about anywhere else in the world. In fact, anywhere else in the world. Uh, the average credit card interest rate in other countries is about 25%. Here it's closer to 15. You cannot buy a home anywhere else in the world and pay three or four or five or six percent interest and that's because we have a credit reporting system that allows lenders to assess risk accurately and therefore base pricing uh, and know that the, the person that they're uh, offering that uh, loan to will repay it as agreed. So makes credit lower cost than anywhere else in the world, makes credit available nationwide so you can move from New York to Los Angeles and not lose access to your credit history and that enables you to get access to the financial tools and resources you need to establish your new life, uh, to rent an apartment, to buy a house, to get a car, to furnish the apartment, whatever that might be. Uh, so you don't have to worry about losing that information. It makes credit widespread in terms of availability, meaning you can use credit to purchase just about anything. Uh, not always recommending that you do that, but you can if uh, you need to. And most important, because you have a credit reporting process that's automated as a consumer, you can use your credit report as an account management tool. And people quite often ask me, they've been out of the country, they've come back, I want to know what I still owe or what's going on with my debts. Get your credit report, look at it just like you do a billing statement. You'll know exactly what's there, exactly what you need to address. So you should use that credit report just like you do a monthly billing statement. Get it at least once a year. It's free, annualcreditreport.com, and I'll mention that again later. You can also get free reports if you come to experian.com slash dispute and need to dispute information. If you don't already have a report, we'll provide a free one for you. A number of other places you can get free credit reports as well. But that it should be a tool that you use in your financial life, just like the other reports that you, uh, or other tools you may have, billing statements, utility statements, and so on. Our role as a credit reporting company 
is not to make decisions about the information in a report. We do not determine or decide or make judgments about the information in a person's credit report. We don't decide whether that information is positive or negative. We don't decide whether a person should be approved or declined. That's up to the lender. They use the report to help them make that decision based on your credit history. How have you managed debts in the past? We will provide a credit report to a business or organization that has a permissible purpose under federal law. The most common is a person applying for credit. Uh, there are others like pre-approved credit offers or for insurance evaluation purposes for government licensing. Uh, so there are about 10 or 12 different uh, reasons that a business can get a credit report, very limited, and we take that very seriously. Um, for uh, in response to, for example, a, a federal grand jury subpoena, we will provide a report. Uh, an example I often use is that when 9-11 uh, happened, a certain government agency that I won't name, first letter F, last letter I, and there's another letter in the middle, uh, came to us and said we want 400 credit reports, and we said provide the subpoenas, and they ended up providing subpoenas for 40 people. Uh, so we are a private company, not a government agency. That's also a, a common misunderstanding. A credit report is pretty simple uh, in that it only includes information about your debts and who you are. We need to identify who you are. So this is what goes into a credit report. We need to know, as I said, who you are. So there's identifying information, name, address, social security number, date of birth, previous addresses, and any variations of that identifying information. So different name spellings, variations in your social security number, variations in your street address will all be included in the report. Those are not errors. We reflect everything that is reported to us as belonging to you. So if you use a different name or a nickname to apply for credit and you use your formal name on another account, you would see both names appear in your credit report. A common misunderstanding is that, or misbelief is that we have access to Social Security Administration records and therefore could match a name to a Social Security number, and that's not true. Uh, we don't. And so we use a very sophisticated matching logic that essentially looks at the accounts that are reported and the Social Security numbers that go with those accounts that are reported as associated with those accounts. And if there are 10 accounts and nine of them so the show the show a social security number, we would presume that to be or determine that to be the accurate social security number for that individual. But if there's a 10th social security number that's not the same, we're still going to list that because it could be an indicator of fraud and we're not going to guess as to which one is right or wrong. Uh, if we did that and we were wrong, we could be exposing that individual to fraud and continuing identity theft. We don't want that to happen. We include that information so that you can see all of it, so that if there is something you need to address, we can help you do that. Uh, the account information, of course, is at the heart of a credit report. Any type of debt-related uh, accounts you may have, so credit cards, automotive loans, mortgage loans, um, charge cards, um, you know, any of those sorts of things, retail accounts, um, merchant accounts could all be part of a credit report, installment loans, personal loans. They will, they will show the association you have with that account, The if it's an installment loan principal amount, if it's a revolving account like a credit card, your credit limit. It will also show your balance. And on credit cards, that is, in, is particularly important because it represents uh, part of the calculation for what we call your utilization rate. So your balance, and it will show your credit limit. Credit li balances divided by limits gives you utilization rate, second most important factor in credit scores, and I'll talk more about that in just a bit. And we'll also show whether or not your payments are being made on time or if they're late, by far the most important component of credit scores. A late payment is going to have a bigger effect, faster and longer than anything else in a credit report on your credit scores. There are also certain public records that appear in a credit report, although far fewer today, as part of an industry-wide initiative, we have removed most public records from a credit report. You will still see bankruptcies and tax liens, but you will be far less likely to see things like uh, civil judgments in uh, a municipal court. You won't see library fines or parking tickets or those sorts of things any longer. Uh, so very few public records, about 80% of them are gone. You may still see a few 
um, but likely we'll continue to see those uh, numbers decline. But I still list it because I will always talk to, there will be one person in the audience who says, I have a public record. So yes, they can't be there, but you'll see far fewer. Now, inquiries are simply a record of who's looked at your credit report. There are two kinds that we call hard inquiries. When you've applied for credit, that type of inquiry represents potential new debt that doesn't yet show as an account and therefore can represent some risk because there's an unknown potential debt associated with it. Within a month or two, maybe three, that inquiry will, will cease to have any real impact on scores because there will either be a new account, which represents the risk, or there won't. And if there's no new account, it doesn't represent risk any longer, so it doesn't affect scores either. And inquiries are by far the least important factor in credit scores. The other kind of inquiry are called soft inquiries. You will see those on your personal report. No one else gets them, so they don't affect credit scores or, or lending decisions in any way. They include things like getting your own credit report, inquiries for pre-approved offers, inquiries for insurance purposes, inquiries for employment purposes. Um, so anything that you did not initiate the transaction is, is not debt related. Uh, so you may see a lot of those, especially if you're getting pre-approved offers. I always tell people, be proud when you're getting pre-approved offers. It means that you can, they, they want you to be a customer, uh, but you can say no. And no is by far the most powerful word in credit. You don't have to accept those offers. Use them as an advantage uh, in opening the marketplace for you because they create a national uh, marketplace, but you can say no. So use them as a financial tool rather than feeling like, hey, I got an offer, I should take it. Never a good decision when it comes to credit thoughtful about how you make those decisions. And on your personal report, you will see dispute instructions. I'll mention that Experian has just launched a new dispute portal and we've updated it to make it much easier, simpler, more efficient, uh, while making it uh, continuing to be safe and secure. Uh, so if you need to dispute information, it's anything in your report that you believe may be inaccurate uh, or doesn't belong to you or could be indic indicative of fraud, you can go to experian.com, experian.com slash dispute. And if you have a report well, you can uh, that's current uh, consumer disclosure, you can immediately start to input information. If you don't have a report, we'll provide a free one for you. So you have a current consumer, what we call a consumer disclosure, the, the uh, consumer version of the report so that you see all of the information we have and it's in a format that's very easy to read and understand. And it's actually the same information that a lender gets with some of those additional inquiries and some other details as well that they don't get. So make sure you have a full report and makes it very easy to dispute the information. So what's not in a credit report? Uh, people think that everything is in a credit report. I'm amazed sometimes at what people tell me they think shows up in a credit report. And as I said, it's really only debt related information and then your ident identifying information so we can match that to you. There's no information about criminal background or arrest records. There's no medical information in a credit report, meaning you will see medical collections, although there have been some changes in the way medical collections are now reported. We will hold a medical collection, for example, for six months before we put it in the credit report so that we can ensure that it's not the result of a billing error or an insurance dispute, that it is a legitimate collection. Uh, scoring systems are also treating uh, medical collections a bit differently, weighing them less heavily in the scores, or in some cases, especially if they're a paid collection, excluding them completely. Uh, but there's no medical information in the report a lender gets, meaning that medical collection would say medical collection. It would not indicate in any way the kind of treatment you received, what the illness might have been, who the collector is, so that there's no uh, issue or concern about violating medical privacy laws uh, for HIPAA, for example. But on your personal report, when you get it, you will see the name of the collection agency and contact information for them for that medical collection so that you can reach out to them if you need to. But lenders never see that information. You'll also never see buying habits or transaction data. So we don't know what you're using, uh, what you're buying when you use credit. So we wouldn't know if you went out and you bought a brand new uh, Chevrolet Corvette Z06 convertible with black leather interior, um, which I would like to, but my wife is wise and won't let me, um, and I and and I shouldn't anyway. Uh, I'll keep driving my compact car, uh, but um, we wouldn't know what you get. We would just see a change of balance or potentially an auto loan, something like that. Uh, there's no income or asset information in a credit report. Also, very commonly misunderstood. So there's nothing about 
what you make at your job. There's no bank account information. Again, going to the asset issue, there's nothing about savings accounts, checking accounts, CDs, IRAs, 401ks, mutual funds, stocks and bonds. Because some people find this hard to believe, but income and assets have very little to do with whether a person will repay their debts as agreed. Just because you have money in the bank doesn't mean you're using that money to pay the debts you owe. Uh, and so credit reports reflect the debts you owe. Credit scores simply reflect whether or not you're paying those debts as agreed. And credit scores are not part of a credit report. They're actually a separate process from credit reporting. We compile a credit report. When we provide that report to a lender, they may ask that we route the report through a credit score that they specify. And at Experian, there's somewhere in the neighborhood of 200, 250 scores that we could route that report through. Um, lenders may also have their own, but scores are a separate process. A new scores calculated each time a new credit report is compiled and requested. So if a lender asks for my credit report at this instant, a score would be calculated. If in 10 seconds another lender requests a report or 10 minutes or 10 hours, a new credit score would be calculated based on the information in the report at that moment in time. So credit scores are not part of a credit report. I will mention that rental information is now part of and has been for about five years experience credit reporting, reporting system. Uh, so you can have your positive rent payments reported to Experian www.experian.com slash build credit history to learn more. What we have found is that in virtually every case, having positive rent payment reported helps a person establish credit for the first time or improve their credit scores if they have an existing credit report. It's almost universally beneficial. Uh, and you can do that voluntarily. So you can work with your landlord. We can report information, whether it's from a one unit, um, apartment in the upstairs of a house or a 10,000 unit apartment complex. And we see landlords have different ways of doing that. So they'll work with, for example, uh, a tenant and report as a uh, benefit to their tenant to help them build their credit history. We'll see uh, tenants actually pay landlords an additional amount in their rent to have it reported because they see that benefit. It's, it's um, a fairly minimal cost that's uh, actually not paid to Experian. It would be to a third party reporting organization that then reports to us. We don't collect any fees at Experian to have rent payment reported to us, uh, but the third party processor may. And you can learn more, again, learn more at Experian.com slash build credit history. We also found that rent reporting is especially beneficial for new immigrant populations, for young people, uh, for divorced women who are typically the uh, side of the relationship that's most adversely affected through divorce uh, and, and continues unfortunately to be that way. Uh, so the, the demographic groups that really need help most, this seems to really be beneficial too. So if you are trying to build a history for the first time, trying to establish credit scores, Something that would be good to, to consider to recommend is that you have your rent payments reported in Experian. We currently only report positive payments, not negative payments. So it's, again, very beneficial. I always like to talk about how long information remains because it's one of the things that I'm always asked about. So I want to quickly run through this chart. Open accounts in good standing remain indefinitely. So if you have an account, never been late, it's open and active, it's going to remain in the credit report. Closed accounts in good standing, never been late, you close the account, they will remain for 10 years from the closed date. When you close an account, you do not lose the credit history for that account. You continue to have that history, you simply won't have new information updated, there's no new payment information to update. So we keep the good stuff longer than the bad stuff. Late payments or missed payments remain seven years from the date of the missed payment. Collection accounts remain seven years from the original delinquency date of the original debt. The original delinquency date's the, for most people, the most important date in the credit report. It's the date that an account first became late, was never again brought current, and subsequently could then be charged off and sold to collection. Collection agencies are required under federal law to report the original delinquency date from the original debt throughout the life of that debt. So they cannot change that debt, which means we can delete that collection account at the same time as the original debt. So at Experian, 
excuse me, in Experian, we treat collection accounts as a continuation of the original debt. Uh, so dates like uh, the most recent activity date, most recent update date, all of the kinds, other kinds of dates you would see in a credit report have no bearing on when an, an account or a, negative, a late payment, pardon me, is, is deleted. The original delinquency date is the most important date. That's what drives when information, negative information comes off a credit report and it cannot be changed as a matter of federal law. Civil judgments remain for seven years from the filing date. Again, you're seeing far fewer of those, but it's still possible. Chapter seven bankruptcy remains for 10 years from the filing date because you do not repay any of the debt. Chapter 13 bankruptcy remains for seven years from the filing date because you do pay part, at least a portion of the debt, so you get a bit of a break there. Unpaid tax liens remain for 10 years from the filing date. Paid tax liens remain seven years from the filing date, and credit inquiries remain for two years. And again, as a matter of federal law, we keep them. In terms of credit scoring, they typically have very minimal effect and typically only for two to three months. FICO scores exclude inquiries after 12 months completely, so uh, we'll see very little impact there from inquiries, but people worry about them a lot. Uh, I don't think you should worry about them nearly as much. An inquiry by itself will never cause you to be declined or even cause you to have to pay higher interest rates. There will always be something more uh, severe or, or serious that leads to that inquiry becoming an issue. So that gets to the thing everybody always wants to talk about, uh, but I, I always provide information about credit reports first because the reality is credit scores reflect the information in the credit report. If you take care of your credit report, your scores will take care of themselves. Uh, you need to take care of that credit report because every score uses that information to do the calculation. It's simply a credit score, is simply a tool that's used to evaluate the information in that report. There are many different credit scores with what we call different models, with different sources and different scales. Our role as a credit reporting company is to apply a model, meaning we can be asked by a lender to compile a credit report. They for lack of a, a you know, more sophisticated explanation, but a, a simple way to think about it is we have huge computer systems with empty space. Compare that to an apartment complex with an, an empty apartment. Scoring companies like FICO or Vantage Score rent space from Experian like a person would rent an apartment to store their algorithm, their scoring mm -hmm. model. We route the report through that keyhole into that apartment uh, when that report's requested. Scores calculated, the score and the credit report go out the window on the other side to the lender, so they go out together. It looks like the score is part of the report because the lender then says, when we get the score and the report, we want the identifying information from the report to appear first, and then we want the credit scores, and then we want the rest of the report. So that's the way it pops up on the screen or when it's printed out on the page. So it looks like a report is part, that's part of me, a score is part of a credit report when in fact it's not, it's a separate process. Uh, so that's kind of where that confusion comes from. The credit bureaus do not know what those algorithms are. They're proprietary to the score developers. We provide the data in the form of a credit report that's used to do the calculation. The scoring companies determine what that algorithm is. Uh, so it's proprietary and it's proprietary to them. So I, I often do this, and it, it may work better with live audiences uh, than people on a webinar, but play along with me. If, you know, I always tell people, this is what credit scores and toilet paper tubes have in common. So it's not what you think. If you remember when you were a child and you played pirate and you put the toilet paper tube up to your eye like a telescope and look through that telescope, all you can see through that tube is what's encircled by that tube. That's kind of what happens with credit scores. When you talk about or hear about credit scores, it's usually in the context, even today, of mortgage lending, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, and FICO. The mortgage lending world, though, is very different than most of the credit uh, space. In mortgage lending, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac specify currently that a FICO score has to be used, and so lenders are relegated to that particular score. Uh, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, from what I understand, still use FICO 2, uh, and FICO has just launched FICO 9, so they're uh, uh, using an older model. Uh, 
uh, as well as a single a score from a single company. Um, when you take that toilet paper tube away, though, this is more of what you see. There are hundreds of different credit scores. There are currently more than 60 different FICO scores. Vantage score needs to be updated because they've just launched FICO or Vantage score 4.0. Uh, there are scores that are custom designed for credit unions. The, the Credit Union National Association, CUNA, actually had a score for credit unions that went from 75 to 108. Uh, credit sc card companies use different scores than auto lenders. And that's fine when you understand that they are each trying to identify risk for their particular type of customer and their particular type of lending. So the scores look at the same information, but they do so in a little different way. You know, auto lenders want to know you're going to pay your car loan on time. Credit card companies want to know you're going to pay your credit card bill on time. The things that indicate risk related to those issues can be different in a credit report. So they study millions of different credit histories and develop scores that help identify those particular characteristics. So the lots and lots of different credit scores. So that begs the question, well, how do I know if I have a real score and how do I know what it means? And the answer is, if you get a score from Experian, you get a FICO score or a Vantage score, depending on where you come into Experian to get that. So if you get your free annual credit report and you choose to purchase a score, you'll get a Vantage score. If you subscribe to one of our monitoring services or get our app, you'll get a FICO 8 score. Uh, or maybe nine now, but FICO 8 for sure. So the, the most recent uh, score that's currently in common use uh, from FICO. Uh, so you get real scores. If a score is used, is developed using the same type of um, logic and technology, they're all real in the sense that they use your credit report to do the calculation. Uh, the CFPB actually did a study and FTC's done studies that have shown that the correlation between any score is very high uh, online to any of the traditional scores that lenders use. Um, if you get a score from Experian, they are scores that lenders actually do use. So, um, you know, in that sense, they're quote real scores. But uh, any score you get online, you should you need to understand is a what I think of as educational in nature. Meaning, when you get the score, it's a real score, it's a FICO score, Vantage score from Experian. But you will not be able to walk into your lender and say, here's my score from Experian, give me a loan. And the reason is they're going to need to get the score that they use, and they're going to want, even if it's the same one, to make sure that it's a current score using current information. They'll probably also check the other credit bureaus and do some other underwriting. So a score that you get from Experian will give you a very, very good sense of where you stand in terms of risk uh, and know, let you know exactly what you are uh, walking into the lender with, so you, you won't have any surprises, uh, but they may get a different number. But if you get a good score from one system, you're going to have good scores on the other. I've never seen an instance where a person had great scores on one and terrible scores from another. Um, maybe different numbers because they use different scales, uh, but still mean the same thing. Uh, by way of example, I, you know, I share my scores. I have the Experian app, and, and my one perk is that I get um, Act to get a, a membership to our premium service. So I get the FICO 8 score and I get other FICO scores, you know, auto scores, bank card scores, and so on. And my scores range from about a, a 780 to 850, depending on the score that you're looking at. Um, and in some cases, I have scores that are, um, you know, 880, 890, uh, because there are scores that actually go to 920. Uh, so my scores generally aren't perfect. And my wife will be the first to tell you that that's an accurate reflection that I'm not perfect. And I try to tell her I'm very close, though. And she just laughs at me. So uh, don't worry too much about the numbers. Instead, focus on the risk factors that go with that score. Every time a credit score is calculated, a series of risk factors are generated. They tell you what to focus on in your credit report to improve your credit scores. Unlike the numbers, the risk factors are very consistent from one score to another. So focus on those risk factors, you will improve all of your credit scores. What goes quickly into a credit score? These are the issues. Payment history, which is with a Vantage score, and this is from Vantage score 3.0. I call it their donut because they took the middle out of the pie. You'll see a very similar chart for FICO. Payment history is going to be 35 to 40 percent of the credit score. Are you paying on time or are you late? How late are you? 
utilization is going to be, in the case of Vantage Score, they break it into two pieces, utilization as a whole, so all of your balances compared to your limits in total, it's about 20%. Your balances on individual accounts is gonna account for another 11%, so about 30, 31%. FICO, same thing, 30, 35%. Those two things alone are gonna account for somewhere between 60 and 70% of your credit score. If you pay your bills on time, keep your balances low, your scores are gonna be fine because everything else builds on those two things. If you're paying your bills on time, you're keeping your balances low, you're going to build a positive depth of credit over time, you're gonna use credit over time, you're gonna have a different mix of credit over time, that's gonna take care of itself. Recent credit, you're not gonna be out applying for lots of new credit all at once, so you're not gonna see lots of inquiries. You're also not gonna see things like late payments occurring recently, large increases in your balances recently. So recent credit isn't just about inquiries, it's also about the other things that might be happening. Have you taken on new debt? Have you paid things off? What's happened in the last three to six months beyond just those new applications for credit? And we often hear discussions that focus solely on the inquiries and recent credit is more than that. And then available credit, what is your capacity um, related to other things like installment count balance, installment loan uh, balances, those sorts of things. Pay your bills on time, keep your balances low, you're gonna have good credit scores because everything else builds on those two things. There's no quick fix. You can't overnight go from a poor score to a great score. You just have to show a, a, a habit, a, an ongoing habit of managing your credit well. Now, so address those risk factors in your credit report over time and your scores will all get better. Uh, just quickly, some credit scoring changes that we're seeing. And some key ones, paid collections in FICO 9, Vantage Score 4.0 and 3.0 are now excluded from the calculation. So if you pay a collection, you could see an immediate improvement in your credit scores. Paying a collection account will also help older scoring models, just not as fast. It will help you recover more quickly, but you wouldn't see it cause a sudden increase in your scores uh, because it's still included in the calculation. But paying it would be positive. I mentioned medical collections before, we're holding them now uh, for six months before putting them in the report. They're also being weighed less heavily and the newest models are excluding medical collections from the calculation, so paying a medical collection could result in an immediate improvement in your scores as well. And we're also starting to see uh, and starting to include trended data in credit reports. You'll start seeing that more frequently. Trended data is looking at what happens within an account over time, not just what is it today, but what does that balance do over months or years? And that's important because what it will do is help people, for example, who have seasonal work uh, and seasonal jobs, you would see them paying debts well over one part of the year, but you might see increases in balances during the downtimes. Trended data will help show that there's still good credit risks because they're managing the debts well, it's just the nature of their work. Uh, so. We think that's gonna be a very positive um, addition to scoring models and to credit reporting. Public records, again, are largely being removed from reports. And auto and mortgage inquiries are still counted as only one account or in the newest systems actually being excluded from calculations. Uh, so you don't have to worry about shopping for the best rates. Uh, in fact, Vantage Score is now including uh, in, um, credit card shopping in that as well. So if you get inquiries for the same type, they'll only count them as one inquiry. So helps you uh, shop for the best rates without having to worry about affecting your credit scores. Um, what are the five secrets to a good credit history? Pretty straightforward. Establish a credit report first. You have to have credit in your name in order to have uh, a credit report. Always then pay as agreed under the con terms of the contract. We recommend that you get a credit card, maybe two. You don't need five or six or 10 or 12. And then make a small purchase each month, pay it in full. That credit card can help build a credit history and help improve scores a bit more quickly because you decide how you're going to use it. It's not like an installment loan where you're told you're gonna to pay this amount on this date every month until it's paid in full. You have some free will with a credit card. Keep your balances below 30% and that's a maximum that, and it's not a target or a goal. The lower your balances are, the better. You do not have to carry a balance. Although I've seen that said a lot lately that you should only pay 95% of your balance uh, on a credit card to help your scores. Absolutely not true. All you do is then pay interest on that 5% that you didn't pay. Uh, the lower your credit balances, the better. Uh, putting on credit cards, uh, the best people with the best scores have balances of less than 10%. And be careful about when you close accounts. It doesn't mean you shouldn't if you have an account you don't use, but if you're going to apply for credit in the next three to six months, 
you might want to keep that account open because you will lose the available limit and this is specific to credit cards you'll lose the available limit which will cause your utilization rate to increase which will cause your scores to drop for a time typically they recover in a fairly short period of time but if you're planning to apply for credits better to leave them alone so that you don't see that dip until you've completed that transaction process so uh, just be cautious about when you do that when it comes to fraud things we all need to do be thoughtful about where and how you share information social media is pervasive and people tell things that you just I just can't imagine that they share I'm going on vacation next week and I live at this address and I'm going to be gone now for a month so um, you know please come visit my home while I'm gone um, but or having teenagers at the store ask for your social security number at the, at the counter ask why you know, be thoughtful about where you share information check your credit reports regularly at least once a year it's free once every 12 months consider subscribing to a monitoring service uh, one of my poll questions would have been uh, if I had thought to ask uh, who has subscribed to a monitoring service uh, because generally you can do so for free when there is a data breach uh, you, we, there's typically a free offer I would suggest you take advantage of those offers if you are you know concerned about fraud you might want to consider subscribing you know it, it can give you peace of mind but that's a decision you make generally you can get subscriptions free now uh, sadly because of the, the prevalence of data breaches uh, there are free security alerts as and have been at Experian for decades since the inception of the Fair Credit Reporting Act they tell people that you may be a victim of fraud or that you are if you file a police report lenders cannot ignore those alerts and typically they will be sufficient to stop ongoing uh, access by a fraudster to your credit history or applications for fraud but the credit freeze is also available for victims of identity theft uh, be the my only caution with a credit freeze is understand what it does and does not do the credit freeze does not prevent everyone from getting access to your credit report so your existing lenders can still look at your report uh, and you then would need to provide if you're applying for credit a pin number to lift that freeze uh, it also doesn't stop identity theft a freeze does not prevent someone from stealing your identity through a data breach or by stealing a computer or by going through your trash it simply comes into effect when they use that information to apply for credit as a result of that identity theft and the studies all indicate that the use of, of identif stolen identifying information to apply for credit only occurs in about 4% of the cases. So 96% of the time, that credit freeze would not trigger uh, as a result of identity theft. Uh, so be aware of that. It's a good tool uh, in some cases, but just understand what it does and does not do. It only gets triggered if someone applies for new credit um, and then therefore uses your credit report. And identity thieves are getting much more clever and not applying for credit they're doing other things applying you know stealing uh, tax records for example and, and applying for taxes which happened to me uh, things like that that don't affect uh, or involve a credit report if you're concerned about fraud believe you may have been a victim go to experience.com slash fraud and you'll be able to add a freeze at no cost and follow up on those issues um, children and identity theft just a few things here we're beginning to see more synthetic ID meaning they'll use parts of identifying information to create a an entire new persona which likely wouldn't uh, affect a child uh, directly in terms of establishing a credit history because it would be maybe their name and a different date of birth and a different social uh, so it would not create a credit report for them uh, and you know there for example other Rod Griffins out there uh, so just a name doesn't really at attach to that individual's credit history but that's a growing problem and we're working on ways to help prevent, detect and prevent that recover from it at Experian we do not disclose reports for minors under age 13 uh, and if a minor requests a report we'll get some identifying information make sure we know who they are we also will alert lenders when a birth date belongs to a minor so that they know that something's wrong potentially uh, and can address it stop the application same things true for social security numbers if a social security number belongs to a minor or would not have been issued or is invalid we will notify the lender when we receive that request for the report so that they can take appropriate action at the point of sale and stop that process now, we do provide free credit reports to parents of children who believe their children may be victims of identity theft if you to do that go to www 
www.experian.com slash fraud and click on the minor child instructions link. It will tell you exactly what you need to provide in order to request that report if we have one. Uh, if we have a credit report on file, we will freeze it at the, cons- at the parent's request. Um, we will not create a file unless required to do so by state law. Uh, and there are a number of states that do. Um, and sadly, the most common fraud is fam- what we call familiar fraud. Somebody knows the child or familial fraud, parents or family of that child, which makes it very, very difficult uh, to address those issues. But uh, still by far the most common source of fraud against children. I mentioned annualcreditreport.com. Great place to go uh, to get that free report. You should do that every year. Uh, and a few of experience resources, again, annualcreditreport.com. I try to say that as often as I can. If you go to experience.com slash credit education, you can find our free education resources and materials. Go to experience.com slash consumer education. You can find lots of other materials and resources you can share, PowerPoint presentations with talk notes, our published materials and brochures, sample credit report, videos, and other things. So all there for you to use at no cost. And with that, I will stop and turn it back over to Rita. Okay, thank you so much. That was wonderful. And you, if I can find you. Right, up in the right hand corner, Rod. Right. Where are you? Wait, wait, wait. There you are. Okay. Okay. So if I do, okay. So I know all of you enjoyed that as much as I did and learned a tremendous amount. We're so appreciative, Rod, really. That's great information. So we're going to take some Q&A in just a moment. But before we do, I did want to tell everyone that we just launched in honor of Financial Literacy Month, um, our brand new financial social work ebook. Financial social work, what it is, what it does, and why it matters in all economic times. There's the link, and you can also go down to the chat box and click on the chat box, and that link will take you there. Um, next month, our um, speaker uh, is really very interesting and unusual. It's about understanding the future of money. It's really going to be very special in a very different way than Ron's session just now. Um, I also wanted to tell everyone that um, we are, again, uh, celebrating Financial Literacy Month and offering a $100 discount coupon uh, for the certification, which is traditionally $595, but now is only... $495 $495 using uh, the coupon code uh, SAVE100. And let's see what we have in the way of questions. So I know there are a lot. And Okay, I think there could be other people with this one, Rod. Can you dispute an education loan, for example, students who went to a for-profit school that does not have accreditation? Yes, I mean, if, if it, especially if you feel it's a fraudulent loan, um, you can dispute it. Um, if it's a legitimate loan, uh, it likely would remain. Uh, and, and, you know, even if it's, you know, it's a private school, huge controversy a, a around those organizations, uh, and I know and understand. Um, but if it's a, it's a legitimate loan, it would probably remain on the credit report. Okay. Um, you know, I think we may have had a problem that people, I can't tell if people... We're able to see our slides or not. You were able to see them, right, Ron? Yeah. And it looks like 
And I have lots of questions that are show, it's showing. So, do you want to grab um, some of them? On yeah, a I can do that. Go ahead. Yeah. So the polls came up with the slides, didn't I guess? And they can, it says they can see it, so we're okay. Um, I'll just pull down a few here. And yeah, and somebody said you can get your credit report free and spread it across every three, every three or four months, and and monitor that way. It's actually a great way to do that. Um, and then if you find something, you might want to get the other two. You know, if there's something you need to address, to make sure that they're addressed on both. Um, medical debt is still reported. Um, if it's a collection account, we typically don't see medical debt reported as uh, a you know a loan, for example. It would just be a medical collection. Um, what is the time frame to search for mortgage and rates? Typically 14 days uh, for the score to be counted, the inquiries to be counted as one. Uh, FICO in some scoring systems, it's 14 days within a rolling 30 day period. So uh, 14, if you, sh you figure out what you can, you want to buy, search for the loans within a two week period. Same thing with a car, uh, a car loan. So 14 days is kind of the rule of thumb I go by. And we talked about education loan. If you use variations of your name and you use the same social, do you have different credit reports? No, and that's a great question. We do not just match to the social security number. It's a common myth. We match to every piece of identifying information that's reported to us. So even if you use a variation of your name, uh, your name is Robert, but you use Bob as well, but you use same address, same social, same date of birth, we're gonna match that. Uh, so you wouldn't change your credit report, you would just see the name variation on that report. What if you notice something that should have been removed after the seven years, but is still showing up on the report? No. Dis dispute it. Experian.com slash dispute and dispute that uh, as being past the deletion time frame. Make sure you understand what the date is you're looking at, because I sometimes have people say it's beyond the seven years when in fact it's not. Uh, and they're looking at, instead of the original delinquency date, they're looking at the open date, something like that. Um, but and that happens quite often uh, but if you see something the original delinquency date is more than seven years in the past uh, you certainly should dispute that we actually watch uh, our files and and may remove them even before the seven-year period to make sure so we track that date as they come on to we absolutely should dispute it do handicapped adults have credit reports if they have had a guardian all their lives um, yes, uh, if if they have a credit history in their name, so if they've opened um, you know, credit accounts in their name, they would have a credit history. Um, you know, physical disabilities or physical challenges have uh, no bearing whatsoever on credit reports. Uh, you, you know, it's it's um, it's just a matter of whether or not you have a, a, an account in your name. There are companies that charge a fee to remove debt from credit reports. How do they do this? And what tool is there for us to educate yeah. our customers they are throwing away money? Um, they don't do it very successfully. Um, the, the scheme is to submit letters of dispute uh, in droves. More than half, something like 70% of the letters that we receive, the correspondence, are disputes by credit repair clinics that are not legitimate trying to make sure you, the, the scheme is that we will miss one of those letters, the lender won't respond within 30 days, and then we would subsequently remove that account from the credit report. What people don't know is that in when the FCRA was amended, Congress recognized that scheme and changed the law so that we can return that account to the credit file. All we do is send a letter to the consumer saying it's been returned when the when the lender comes to us and says we missed it but it should remain we'll send a letter to the consumer saying it's being restored so they don't actually get it removed um, but they um, dupe consumers into believing that uh, it was removed by showing them a report when it's gone for the few days or whatever it might be that it, that it was um, there is a law called the credit repair organizations act everybody should be aware of that uh, it explains exactly what a credit repair firm must do before they take a penny from the consumer. So they have to have a written contract, they have to fulfill that contract in full before they take any payment from the consumer, they have to allow three days to withdraw from that contract. So you have a, a lot of rights to protect you from that kind of 
it's effectively fraud. Uh, and for most people, if you have the money, the cash to pay a credit repair firm, you're probably better off putting it towards the debts you owe to reduce those balances. That will do more to help your scores faster and over the long term than paying a credit repair firm to, to get that information uh, falsely removed. Uh, the FTC has said you cannot get accurate information re removed from your credit report before the specified time frames. Um, you know, so the Federal Trade Commission is a, a pretty good source to quote. Is it true that paying on an account twice per month versus once per month helps increase your score? Yeah. No. Uh, so it doesn't matter whether you pay twice a month or once a month. It doesn't matter if you pay you know, two weeks or three weeks before the due date or right on the due date. The key from a credit reporting perspective is that you are paying on time. So that would be the due date. So the number of times you pay in a month or you're paying early doesn't affect your scores. Uh, it's just that you're current and that's what you want to see uh, current and, and paid as agreed on the credit report. Now paying twice a month could help reduce your balances if you're able to pay more than you otherwise would be able to if you made one payment uh, and that could help your scores uh, simply because you're reducing your 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 balances more each month uh, and so you have a, a lower utilization rate. So you need all accounts flow 30% or an overall average of 30%. Some cards may have a limit, but the card is not being used. Uh, bring down the overall utilization. Yeah, um, all of them actually. So credit scores look at your total utilization across all of your credit cards. And they also look at utilization on your individual accounts. So having a, a high utilization rate on one card will also hurt your credit scores. So you need to have the average be below 30% and you want your utilization rate on individual cards to be below 30% as well. The lower, the better. Someone explains that when she bought her house in Florida, she started uh, getting a lot of credit card calls. And then this, and uh, they also happened to a friend and a family member when they too purchased their home. It almost seems like buying a home opens up the door to fraud. Please advise. Yeah. Um, it's not so much the door to fraud. When you buy a house, uh, you know, there's a public record that you bought a house. So it's not really coming from the credit reporting companies. It's, it's from, uh, you know, the public record um, world that the house has been sold. There's a new uh, owner in town and you're probably going to want to buy things to furnish that house or to paint the house or do whatever it is, you know, put curtains in the house, whatever it might be. And so it's uh, an opportunity when people are open to, uh, opening new accounts. And so the lenders want uh, credit card companies and others want to take advantage of the opportunity to offer you the chance to be a customer of theirs. Um, you know, so, you know, that's the whole, you can say no issue. It's still a good idea to check, you know, always check your credit reports, make sure everything's okay. Watch those billing statements. Um, you know, but homeowners, uh, home ownership is expensive. Uh, and you also will find yourself, you know, availing yourself of credit potentially more often, especially when you first buy that house. So it's an opportunity to offer the chance to be a customer rather than fraud. Oh, Rod, it just looks like the questions keep coming in. I know, yeah. but I know we're well, uh, way over time. I, I really like to thank you. And I know that our audience would like to thank you too. You shared such valuable information and I hope we can have you back in the near future. Absolutely, be happy to. All right, everybody. Well, thanks so much. Yes, lots of people writing. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, so. Uh, we will see all of you back here next month, and we want to take this opportunity to wish you all a wonderful Financial Literacy Month. Bye now. <laughs>